service with a mini cantata. All right, let's do our verses together. The elder, the elder unto the, the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. For the, for the truth's truth sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. God, be with you, mercy, and mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as he have heard from the beginning, he should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have brought, but that we receive the full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. 
If he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath the both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. All right, I'm missing something here. Sound girl. Have you grabbed my, my mic? Mom. It's on the back there. Sound girl. <laughs> Leah, I think her name is. It's that wire thing on the, it's, you see it hanging there on the shelf, on the shelf. The head, the headphone thing. Uh, this thing? Yeah, yeah, bring that here for me. <laughs> Primarily for Keith, who's not here with us today, but and probably for this too. What's that? Probably for this too. <laughs> All right, let's sing our first hymn, "Sound the Battle Cry." Let's stand together and sing hymn six hundred and thirty, please. They came to Thessalonica, where it was a synagogue of the Jews. Paul and his manner went in to them, and uh, for three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, uh, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. And it, really, it's quite a few in the translation, so sometimes it comes out a negative, which is a positive. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, gathered a company, and set out all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them 
out uh, to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These have turned the world upside down and are come hither also. I'm going to stop there. We're going to look farther, but that's what verse I want to leave us with is the concept of the impact that these men had in uh, the, the surrounding areas of Thessalonica. So may God bless us as we embrace this part of Scripture. As we go to prayer this morning, just an update. Uh, Jimmy was on his way to church and fell. And uh, weakened from the um, chemotherapy. And uh, so pray for Jimmy and his family. Uh, pray for his kids. They're, they're all concerned about him. And uh, I, I told uh, Jimmy's uh, um, daughter-in-law, right, um, that this is where he wants them to be, not with him, you know, so uh, you're going to get a star. But <laughs> Jimmy's going to be happy to know that one of his kids came. But his whole prayer was that he, he would see his kids with him in church. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he didn't plan on getting cancer, uh, but a lot of times, you know, God will work in your life uh, to get the attention of the people in your life in a certain way. So pray for Jimmy. Give him strength. I know chemo takes a, 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 a toll on the body, and uh, he wants to be here. Pray for Louise as well. Uh, she spent the day in the hospital, and uh, they sent her home saying there's nothing wrong with her. And uh, she distinctly knows that there's something wrong. She has a pain and things like that. So they're, she's not real happy with them. And uh, I think when you get to be a certain age, you don't qualify anymore for help. You know, so it seems like I've heard that in more than one occasion where you get to be a senior citizen and they don't want to bother, you know, so. But pray for her as well. She wants to be here. Pray for Keith. Keith got his, uh, um, Laird, there's a voice box repaired. From what I gather, what they did was they reversed everything and now he talks back. So they took the implants out and his voice came back. So I think that was uh, maybe one of the problems we'll see. And I'm sure we'll be seeing him in a week or so as he recovers. Pray for Elaine as well as uh, she recovers from her um, injuries. And uh, Matt and Mary, of course, ongoing problems. Matt has uh, um, a problem with his back that he might have to have surgery and uh, uh, Mary, and I'm not sure exactly what's um, her problem other than she doesn't have an appetite, can't taste anything and doesn't eat much so that, that can cause some problems with her as well. So um, pray for um, our healthy family, Alan Janet are here, <laughs> healthy as can be. You call his wife for healthy, you know. We're all going down that same boat, you know. So we need to pray for each other as we go into the uh, flu season. And uh, we don't know what's next. But uh, um, I'll pray for uh, Miriam. And she's excited to see Margaret and Justine going down in, uh, where are you going, Jane? Very 31st, but getting there February 1st. Okay. And, uh, um, Pray for Stefan and Rebecca. They're, they're, uh, they have a challenge before them. They've been in language school for a few months. Uh, but can you imagine learning the language in one year uh, to be able to turn around and then uh, converse in it and teach in, in the language? So uh, Stefan is German, uh, but he has to learn Spanish. He just got done learning Bengali, and he wasn't all that good at that. So I'm not sure what a German Spanish accent sounds like, but you know, God, God called him to that land and God will enable him. So pray for him. And of course, Jonathan and Hozuku as they serve in Japan. Anybody have a prayer request? I know if Pop was here, Jimmy, he'd want everybody to pray for Sky, which I'm not sure of the updates of him. Okay, I have her on my list here. S K A Y E. Pray for Sky. Janet? Uh, please pray for Baby, Vivian.
the wisdom for how we um, Paul has been denied his benefits and it would be extremely difficult for him to live at home with, with no funds or food and what he was getting and the health care. <coughs> but it's just that God would lead us and give us wisdom. How could they deny him this? Because he lives in a house that... There's a lack of funding, you know. Oh, okay. You know, you know how that's spelled. All right. Margaret? I told um, we own a house in Pennsylvania, and there's a young gentleman, Jeremy Webb, lives next door, and he had a brain tumor removed to going on three weeks ago. Um, has a young family. I told him we'd be praying for him. His brother was uh, lost his leg in a war too, right? Pray together, Father, we're thankful for this moment in time. Uh, we have uh, total confidence in your ability and uh, to answer the prayers that uh, have been set before you. We're thankful, Father, you are capable and uh, are uh, in a position to uh, be in our lives and help us. Pray for uh, Jimmy and his family. Lord, give them grace. Uh, give Jimmy strength as he goes through this uh, chemo process. And uh, we, we know that his prayer is that his children would follow him in, in as far as uh, following Christ. And we pray, the Lord, that you would answer that prayer. We pray, Father, for um, Vivian, the little one, with respiratory problems, and we pray that you would give the parents strength and wisdom as well. Give uh, Al and Janet wisdom as they try to help Paul and uh, uh, figure out what to do with him and provide for him. We pray for Louise, that you would give her strength, and uh, we pray that some doctor would be willing to help her, and we pray for Gerard and his ongoing needs with his uh, hip and uh, knees and uh, um, Keith, we pray Lord, that you would he would recover soon and Elaine as well and for Keith and, and for uh, uh, Mary and um, Matt, Lord, that you would just intervene in their lives as well. It gets pretty discouraging to be ill and hurt all the time and uh, we pray for Chester that he would uh, find a placement and, uh, and uh, have uh, uh, more success over the diseases that he has. And uh, we pray, Lord, for uh, Stefan and Rebecca, Lord, that you would uh, bless them in their studies, Father, so that they could be effective in Peru. And we pray for the moments we have together, Lord, that you would be honored, uh, that we would uh, be able to not only understand your word, but to apply it in our own lives, Father. We just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We'll sing one more hymn together. 567. You can stay seated. We used to sing this at the seminary, or at the Bible college level too, right? Um, Creed Wilshire's favorite song, I think. All your anxiety.
find ourselves as we travel with Paul is that he now begins the second missionary journey and we find within the passage here that he uh, goes through two towns Amphilius and Apollia and then comes to Thessalonica. What we'll find with Paul is that he seeks out first synagogues. Now, I think I mentioned last week that uh, to have a synagogue in a town you have to have at least 10 Jewish men. So uh, in those two towns, there probably wasn't one. If you remember from our last study, in the town that he was in, Philippi, there was no synagogue. So he went out to the river, which uh, Levitically wise was a place where they could pray uh, if there was no synagogue, if there were Jewish folks there. We found out that Lydia and her friends were there and people came to Christ there. But what I'm gonna do today is um, look at Paul. And first we find um, what I would classify as formulated preaching. And Paul had an intent and a goal uh, to be able to share the gospel, not just to Jewish folks, but to anybody that would listen. But he knew within the synagogue there would be those there that might be willing to listen. See, the synagogue was designed for Jewish men to come in and to sing hymns and to listen to the word and to listen to someone uh, open up the word. So on the occasion that someone would come, uh, for example, with Paul and Silas and Timothy and with Barnabas, uh, they would be asked to share. And so Paul's, uh, in the idea of a formulated uh, mission, uh, we would call that today being prepared expositorily. Matter of fact, it would be more like in a teaching setting because when we read the passage, we read a word that said reasoning. And that in Greek, we get the word for dialogue. And so what Paul's uh, mission was, wasn't to just stand in front of somebody and preach, but to open up the word and have interaction. And so that's, that's a little different than we usually do in church. Because... Uh, more than likely, it would take longer to get through a passage. Sunday school class, we get away with that if there's a question and we deal with it, you know, because of 
we're not really worried about the time constraints. But in preaching, then, we have a message that we feel that God has given us, and we try to deliver it. Uh, now, I've been in some churches where Sunday morning would be the message, then you come back Sunday night, and then there's the dialogue. So you come with your questions. Now, Pastor, you said this. What did you mean by that? And then there's an interaction. I think that's an excellent thing uh, to do. And uh, that church had quite a bit of um, enjoyment out of that. But um, in our case, we're just going to have to look at the passage. And we find Paul and Silas in the synagogue. It gives us a time reference, which can be quite confusing. And uh, uh, the, the whole missionary journey, we consolidate it in, in our minds as he's, well, he's here, he's there. But remember, he's on foot. So between, even between the, the first two towns, uh, you're talking um, from there, it was at least 100 miles. So, um, so I got to preach tomorrow in Riverhead. I better start hoofing it, you know. And if you go, so they were, this, there was a, this was why it was called a journey. And uh, uh, Paul and Silas and uh, now Luke stayed back, so he stayed in Philippi, so Paul and Silas and whoever else was with them, uh, they made the trip. And uh, so Paul had a strategy, and his idea was, and this comes out of uh, several books that I've uh, looked at and their opinions, and I think it, it expressed itself in Scripture, that Paul knew that if he goes to these bigger cities with the Word of God and God blesses, that's kind of a hub where then those people go out. Remember, Lydia was not from Philippi, but she was from another place, and she was there on business, perhaps. And so these bigger cities where the word would get out, then those folks would go their way and spread the, the good news. So in his missiology thinking, Paul was trying to be the most effective in reaching people for the lost. So in the passage of Scripture, we find ourselves... Um, and Paul in his manner was. So what we have in the formulation of preaching, I broke it down into smaller bits for us to try to just think about. One of the things that we find with Paul was that he was faithful. So faithfulness comes into this, this whole ministry. Now we're looking at Paul and Silas and their missionary journey, but uh, the purpose of reading the passage for us today is to say, where do I fit into this? How, what can I learn from Paul and from Silas and others that really fits my way of life? And so, to start with, uh, Paul was faithful. Now, Paul has been, let's see, beaten, whipped, imprisoned. So those are the things that he has in his background from his second missionary journey. So those aren't necessarily favorable things that happen to you. And say, now, how can I, what, what can I change to avoid that? That wasn't his game. See, being faithful to God means that he's 100% on the same page. His mission, if you carry back over to the Great Commission, was to go to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles with the gospel message. That was the mentality of Paul. And uh, that's why he was so concise in his thinking. And his strategy reveals itself. So there's three aspects of his faithfulness in these first couple of verses. One was worship. So he went where they would be. You go on a fishing trip, where do you usually go? Where the fish are, right? If you saw me fishing in the front yard of the past parsonage, you would think, well, maybe he's got a few screws loose because I'm never going to catch a fish in the front yard. So I'm going to go to the sound of the ocean or to a pond. And so Paul says, all right, I'm going to go to the synagogue. That's where the Jewish men were, effective men, businessmen, and their families. Now, usually it was just Jewish men there, but in Paul's thinking, he's going that route. So in worship, he goes to God's house. There are a lot of people today saying, well, I don't have to go to church to worship God. God's everywhere. Well, in one respect, that's true. But if you really want to worship God, you have to, ex you have to examine his word. And God's word says, do not forsake the assembly. 
So God's plan for us is to be in a church, an ecclesia. Now, a synagogue, if you translate it, would be like an assembly. Some people want to make the jump from the synagogue to the church. Um, we, we would call that uh, a stretch. There are, there's a synagogue down the street, so they are still here. But from that, when the church age was formulated, instead of meeting on the Sabbath, they met on the first day of the week, which we call Sunday. So there are some differences, but the assembly together is what we're looking at. Now the Bible says where one or two are gathered together in his name, his presence is there. But if you look at the context, it's his place, his house. So if you're here today to worship God, you, you came to the right place. Now if you're fishing on a boat, you can dwell about God, think about God. But in reality, God really wants you to be in church and go fishing on Monday. So Paul's there. Uh, to worship. His walk, this is that phrase, th his manner. Uh, you know, don't make a small or a big deal out of it. It says in Paul, as his manner was. So he had a regime. Uh, he had a plan uh, to go. Uh, one of the things I think that we sometimes neglect is the idea that when I go out of the house tomorrow, I should have a strategy of sharing the gospel. You know, uh, you call and his wife, they walk in the neighborhood, they have a strategy. They want to meet people and share the gospel with them and get exercise as well. So even though you have a busy life and you work someplace, uh, our real goal as believers is to serve him. And our only real function is to communicate the truth, the gospel message, the hope of the world. And so in Paul's ministry, his manner was to go there first. And we'll find later that he gets just uh, to the point where he says, all right, I'm going to just go to the Gentiles, the Jewish people. Because we'll find even in this section, uh, he comes up with difficulties, even though God really opens the eyes of a lot of people. So we have a worship, we have a walk, and in his work, uh, in his work method, um, this is what I would classify as his message. Um, I broke that down into three things. Um, his explanation, it says, he says in verse 3, opening and alleging. That's uh, kind of like uh, explaining and demonstrating. Now, the scriptures that Paul possessed were the Old Testament scrolls. There was no New Testament there. So his, his whole um, armament was the Old Testament, bringing out of the Old Testament the Messianic passages uh, to culminate in Christ. And that's exactly what he did. All these Jewish men that were in the synagogue, they were waiting, waiting and hoping for the Messiah. When Jesus showed up, they rejected him. Uh, they thought Messiah was going to come and free them from Rome. They misunderstood, partly because of the rabbis and the priests had misled them for quite a while. And, uh, you know, so, and, and they rejected him as well. So Paul, uh, who was once a Pharisee, and uh, I'm sure these folks knew about Paul, who was Saul at one time. He, he begins the idea of opening up the scriptures and uh, demonstrating that Christ must have suffered and died and risen again from the dead. Uh, the Messiah was destined for the cross. It doesn't make any sense to a lot of people. You know, why would God come into human form and end up dying on the cross. Well, redemptive um, required, redemption required that sinless blood, you know, and uh, uh, this all, this knowledge all comes as someone embraces the Holy Spirit, uh, embraces Christ, and God reveals it to him, uh, the necessity. But that's exactly what Paul was going after. Notice he didn't have any kind of social, cultural message. It all seemed to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his goal in his preaching. And uh, you can't go far from that. Uh, most pastors will spend thousands of hours and years sometimes preaching through the scriptures and neglecting the obvious overtones of the Messiah and Christ and the need for salvation. Um, biblical history has its place. But uh, when it comes down to priority, the priority is how do I go from headed to hell to going to heaven? And that's exactly what Paul was revealing here, that the Lord Jesus Christ 
was the Christ, the Christos, the Messiah, the anointed one. The one they were looking for is the one that they condemned. So his application is found here. He says, and, and risen from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Is the Christ, would be a better way of saying it. Interesting that that's Paul's message. Not the uh, Levitical law, not the need or absence of circumcision. All these, he focused like a um, laser beam on this one thing, because this was the one message that would change people's lives, the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion, will you can fill your mind and body with the word and miss Christ. Go to Catholic church, go to a Methodist church, go to a lot of churches, and there'll be lots of people there, and they'll be worshiping and uh, religious-wise, but lost in their sins. Uh, only the Lord Jesus Christ can change you totally and make you a new creature in Christ. So Paul's goal was, in his formulated preaching, was to reveal, explain, and apply. What we see next is fruit. And some of them believed. And uh, the word consorted is the idea of joined up with Paul. Perhaps that's where the help comes from. But they joined up. Even in that part of the century, those Jewish people that came to Christ, the rest of their families would um, just abandon them. Kind of like the, I don't know if you ever read about the Amish folks, but if you're an Amish person and you turn away from their way, they uh, shun you. And that's similar to what the Jewish folks do. Even in our day, when I was in um, my church as a kid, uh, a Jewish couple came to Christ, and their family had a funeral for them. Their mother and father wouldn't talk to them. It was terrible for them. And uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what happened to them, but it was a real eye-opener uh, to us. And, uh, well, we see the fruit of it. Some believed that, and uh, joined up with Paul's house, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and uh, quite a few of the uh, prominent women. Uh, King James says, and of the chief women, not a few. But the not a few doesn't mean just a few, but it means it wasn't a few, it was a lot. So you got to kind of look at that, because every time I read it, it's like, that doesn't sound right. But, uh, you know, but the Jews which believe not, and so we have the black and white of ministry. God will open the hearts of some, but some hearts will be closed. And in this case, it says the Jews which believe not moved with envy. This is one of the problems that we see all the way back into when Christ first started his public ministry. The, the Jewish folks, some embraced him, but others were envious, and they didn't want Jesus to have the same kind of power that they had. And uh, they, they were resistant to Christ. Pride and uh, their hold on the people. Jesus would uh, reveal to the people in front of them that they their father was Satan, and uh, they were lying to them. And so they, this is what happened too. The Jews believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, worthless men from the rabble of the marketplace. A better way of saying it, they were just idle, non-workers. Seems to me we see that a lot in our day. You know, we need some people to be rabble rousers. I'll give you ten dollars an hour. Okay, I'll take the job. You'll see that we've seen that in the last couple of years, uh, menacing groups, destroying things, and being paid for it. That's what this is right here. They gathered them together. They were clueless to what was going on. They were just being compensated. Set up all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason because that's where Paul and Silas were staying. And uh, uh, when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city. The, the rulers usually were in the marketplace. And, uh, you know, another uh, usage of the synagogue was for punishment as well. And so synagogue, sometimes that facility be used uh, in a different way. But in this case, we find that um, the statement that I would say is the one statement in this chapter that you would highlight and uh, is uh, an opportunity for us as well. It says, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. 
So these people who have stirred up trouble throughout the world have come here as well. Um, their trouble was they were giving a message of freedom. See, governments and religions thrive on control. Legalism will tell you, you know, you should have a suit tie on and ladies have long dresses and wear little hats and, uh, you know, don't uh, go here, don't go there. Uh, legalism is a, a trap uh, of parts of religion that uh, control people. And when Paul comes with the gospel message, and it's a message of freedom, and a message that will frees them from the bondage of life, listen, the joy that we experience really has very little to do with life itself. It has everything to do with that relationship we have with Christ. That's why people that are believers today, no matter where they find themselves, there's that sense of peace. I bet you if you ask Jimmy, Jimmy will say, I'm in God's hands. You, you know what value that is to be able to separate yourself from the pressures of the world and life, uh, the unknownness of death, and all the things that are happening, when, you have, when you're in the center of God's hand, God holds you, it says, and protects us and gives us that sense. When my kids were little, here's one of my little boys here. When he was little, he never worried about anything. He just lived his life. He knew that mom and dad would provide for them and take care of them, and he was happy most of the time. <laughs> As he got older, when he comes a teen, then you wonder. But he was always a good kid. Uh, but that's kind of the idea uh, of believers today. We place our trust in God. And we sang the song about anxiety. There's a Bible verse that says, cast all your care to him. That means it doesn't disappear, but the load is changed. You know, you ever have a, something you got to share? It's just going to kill you if you don't share it. And that, that's the idea of giving God that information. He knows how you feel already, but surrendering to him, and he alleviates the pressure of it. So we have uh, the foes. We have the assault on them, the arrest, the accusations. They're charged as troublemakers. There's one thing about their charge, though, is pretty true. Um, it says, and when they had taken Jason and the others, they let him go. Okay, but... Um, one of the charges, because Paul and uh, Paul headed to Berea, uh, they caught Paul and Silas and snuck him out of the town so they couldn't get arrested. And uh, but what what they were accused of was against the laws of Rome. Caesar was to be them their king, and Paul was presenting Jesus as the king. And so, in one respect, they were kind of accurate, but they were missing the mark. Now, these are Jewish folks that complained every day about Roman oppression. So, it, it, to me, in my mind, I'm thinking it doesn't make much sense. But uh, the, uh, the charges had to be manufactured to try to get the attention of those that were in the, the judicial part of it. And anytime you raise your voice about they're against Caesar, then they get up in arms because... Uh, their position is preserved by the Roman Empire itself. So that you see that back when Jesus was uh, being, uh, uh, being um, harassed and, uh, you know, goes up before Herod and all that stuff. You'll see that the same idea of relationship between the Jewish uh, pundits that were in charge of Rome when uh, put them there. Uh, so what we have is uh, the formulated preaching. We have uh, the faith phrases now that I wanted to show you. Um, what I mean by that is that we have uh, Paul now, chapter, uh, verse 10, and the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So we have a repeat now in a different place. So in this case, uh, they survived the altercations with uh, the Thessalonians, now they're in Berea, which I think is quite interesting because out of all the groups that Paul went to, this is the group that uh, if we we're going to try to emulate, this is the group we want to be. 
because Paul really kind of compliments them. Not because they were studious and listening, but the Bereans were the kind of type that said, okay, Paul said that, let me go back and look it up and see if it's right. That's the kind of student that you have to be. Not just listen to Pastor Hall and whatever he says goes, but to say, okay, let me go back in scripture and see what it says. Let me make sure that it's right. Uh, that's what the Holy Spirit gives us in the idea of discerning the spirits. You get close enough to God and you listen to some preacher on the radio, your ears will perk up when you hear something that doesn't sound right. Have you ever gone through that? That didn't sound right. And then as you study, you find out that uh, perhaps he was wrong or manipulated the passage for some different agenda. The uh, Pentecostal groups today, especially on the radio, you have people that are promising people, you know, health and money and all sorts of things. And all you have to do is listen to them and send them your money. You know, and they'll use the scriptures and it sounds like, well, this is the year of Jubilee. And so if you send me $10, God will give you 50 times back. You know, so it's a manipulation of the truth. Satan was really good at that. In the garden, he said, the woman said, did God really say that? You know, Satan knew how to manipulate. And so we have to be aware of those things. The safeguard is for you to be the student of God's word and study for yourself. Don't worry about everything else. The Bible has to take priority. And if you know Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit resides in you and will give you the understanding that you need. So what we have is an openness here in verse 10 and 11. These were noble than those in Thessalonica. Uh, and the word noble has the idea of open-mindedness. You ever talk to somebody that's closed-minded? That's for, you know, the sky is blue. No, no, it's not. It's, it's white. You know, the, it's cloudy. No, there's no clouds. You know, they're, they're just closed-minded. Uh, there's no hope. The Bereans were open. They were, they were waiting and listening to the word of God. And uh, uh, verse 10 says, uh, or verse 11, these are the mortal, and that they received the word. That's number one. Your heart has to be open to receive the word of God. Now you're receiving it in your ears, but that's different. You acknowledge that you're hearing something come out of my mouth. We're reading the Bible together. But receiving it in your heart means, Lord, this is true. If it's, I'm not there, then take me to there. Change my life and my heart, my attitude, whatever it needs to be. A lot of times the Word of God will reveal that as you study. The Bereans were there. They received the Word with readiness of mind. They didn't have their cell phones out watching the game. Oh, nobody's here like that. I remember the last man standing, what's his name, would be in church, and he'd be listening to the game. He'd go, yeah! <laughs> no, yeah, you know, so that's, that's what it means. We're, our minds are ready. We're thriving. We're pulsating at the truth. And uh, um, it says, the Bereans researched it, verse 11, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. That's the best part of this. You know, they were willing and ready but they weren't so gullible as to just take it at face value. They'd go look it up themselves. You have a Bible in your hands? You possess a Bible. There you go. Look it up. See what it says. That's the best advice I can give you as a student is to study for yourself. And when I was in school, I always looked for the shortcuts. I got to read this book 500 pages. There's got to be a book that has a summary page. You know, I'll just read the summary. Only drawback is that you don't get the data when the test comes. All you have is summary information and it doesn't go over too well. So I learned my lesson the hard way a few times. But, you know, laziness creeps in because it's easier to watch TV than read the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Just sit there with your eyes open and watch. The Bible takes a little bit of concentration and, uh, and focus. And uh, so it's uh, more of uh, intuitive. My grandfather used to tell me when he worked in the mines, you had the darkness, all you had was candles for light. You had the dust, and you had the ground groaning. Those are the three factors that you had to deal with while you were digging for coal. And the only way to get paid was to dig the coal. The slag, you didn't get paid for it, but you had to get rid of that. That was the rocks, and the coal was in it. 
the Bible is right before us, but for me to get the coal, I have to be willing to dig. And the dig in the circumstance that there's going to be the telephone, the little girl crying, right? Every time you really want to do something, the kids are always there, the dog throws up, uh, the neighbor comes over, uh, the television is in every room, you know, so there's certain things that we have to say, okay, I'm going to shut that all off. Now, not the kids, of course, but uh, those will come into play. And so there has to be a formulation of priority. How important is it for me to read the Bible? And, uh, you know, uh, the more you read it, the more you find out that, boy, I didn't know that, and I need to dig more. And the more I read the Bible, the more I grow closer to him because I appreciate who God really is. And so we have the Bereans responding. And uh, uh, many of them believed. And it's an interesting occasion when we read that. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul and Berea, they came, they came over and stirred up the people again. Immediately the brethren sent Paul to go as if it were to the sea, but Silas and Timothy stayed there. We don't have the time, um, they don't give us the timings here, but think about it uh, in reality. Three, three Sabbaths is three weeks. And so there was t time spent, and uh, uh, they were really focused on Paul. Paul might have been the mouthpiece. So Silas and uh, who else stayed with him? Silas and Timothy stayed there with them and ministered to those that came to Christ. There's always need for um, a time of learning when someone comes to Christ, and uh, you know where they need to learn the fundamentals of what the Scripture says. And uh, we see that throughout the New Testament. And uh, they had conducted Paul and brought him to Athens and received the commandment of the Silas and Timothy uh, to come to him with all speed that they parted. Now next week we're going to look at Athens because this is where Paul really kind of gives us some um, um, insight into how to reach people for Christ. Athens was a pagan area and uh, the Mars Hill, all they had was Greek God statues everywhere. And he saw the paganism of it. But he found one that had no name on it. See, they wanted to cover all bases. I remember the guy from the mummy. You know, the mummy was after him, and he keeps pulling out necklaces until he got to the Star of David and the mummy recognized him. Remember that? No, probably don't. I do. No, I do. But he was covering all the bases, you know. And uh, this is what Paul went to that unknown God and began to preach to them from there. And so we're going to look at that next next Sunday as we uh, close. I was going to, we only have four minutes, so it's almost impossible because we're going to talk about the false philosophies of the day. There are a lot of them floating around today. A lot of philosophies that have been um, hatched from the minds of men who really don't really care about you, but really want to control your thought processes and focus your attention on their agenda. And so philosophies really come into play. And so we're going to look at that next week, their philosophies and then the strategy that Paul uses that I think comes right out of uh, the passage that would help us in our attempt to share the gospel. Anytime you share the gospel, uh, the person might be curious and try to get you off track. You know, um, how could God create the earth? Now, what would answer would you give? I'd start from who he was who he is, the creator. Only God could create the earth, is where I would go, where they would say, because their agenda would be to bring in evolution and all the other things that are coming that way. We'll, we'll discuss that next week. So let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for this moment in time and uh, the adventure that we could enjoy as we study this missionary journey. Watching uh, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Dr. Luke as they uh, minister and share uh, the truth of the gospel to a pagan world. Seeing the Holy Spirit open the eyes of Gentiles and Jewish folks and uh, uh, working in their lives, Father. We're, we're seeing it on the page of Scripture, and it's the same as today. The same gospel message, the same freedom is offered. And we, we pray, Father, they would lead and direct us 
We especially pray for Jimmy, give him strength, uh, give his family opportunities to encourage him and he as he encourages them as well. And we just give you the praise in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing one more hymn together. Uh, Be still my soul. Let's stand together. Go the other way. Okay, go back. There it is. Oh, there it is. <laughs> church folks, um, especially me with Jimmy and for Keith and Elaine and Matt and Mary Father and others, Father, Lord, that you would just work in their lives and we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 